Well, if you have your Bibles, if you'd open with me now to the gospel according to Matthew chapter 21 this morning, and I want to draw your attention to verse 28 as we pick up where we left off, looking this morning at the parables of judgment. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 28, if you would follow along with me. The words of Jesus, but what do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and he said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and he went. Well, then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first, Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you didn't believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Shall we pray together? Father, thank you for these parables, these passages of scripture. Lord, I pray that you would open up your word to us today, Lord. You you know, Lord, every heart represented here, every need in this room. And so, Lord, we trust that your Holy Spirit will take the word of God and it will not return void. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the last week of his life, leading up to the cross, Jesus went into the temple And he overturned the tables of the money changers and he disrupted the dishonest dealings of the religious leaders. Becoming unhinged with anger, the religious leaders retaliated with a calculated verbal assault against Jesus, demanding that he provide them with proper authorization for his sabotage of their commerce. Jesus was fully prepared to give a statement concerning his authority. If only his accusers would answer him one small question. And the question was this, was the ministry of John the Baptist from heaven or from men? Now, if they answered from men, then the people would turn on them because they believed that John was indeed a prophet. On the other hand, if they said, from heaven, Jesus would say to them, then why did you not believe him? But rather than answer the question, they lied. Choosing to plead ignorance, they simply said, we don't know. But the confrontation did not end there. Jesus actually responds to them with a trilogy of parables that presented three perfect illustrations that characterize the religious leaders and expose them for what they truly were. The first parable was about two sons. And in these verses that we read just a moment ago, we saw a parable presented where there was a father, he owned a vineyard, and he had two sons, and he called them both to go into the vineyard and work. And the first son was asked to go into the vineyard by his father, and he responded, I will not. You ever asked your child to do something? And they said they won't? It was like that here. However, later on, he regretted it. He felt bad about it, and he went into the vineyard and worked. But then he came to the second son and asked him to go into the vineyard, and he said, I go, sir. But... He never went. That also has happened before, perhaps, with you. Both of these sons were given the same command. Both were given the same opportunity. The only difference, one obeyed and the other did not obey. After his parabolic illustration, Jesus followed up with a question. It was simple. Which of these two did the will of his father? It's obvious. They said the first The religious leaders answered the question correctly, but they did not expect the interpretation of the parable to directly apply 
to them. Verse 31, Jesus said, I say to you, here's the interpretation, tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. John came to you in the way of righteousness. You didn't believe him, but the tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when they saw it, or when you saw it, you did not afterward relent or believe. The interpretation of the parable would have completely offended the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. The owner of the vineyard is the Lord. The first son in the parable was representative of the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Tax collectors were considered the lowest life form in society because they worked for Rome. They were considered to be traitors to their own people, to their own nation. They were professional extortionists. They collected taxes, and by doing so, it kept Rome in power. And right there with them, in the bottom of the barrel, seen as being completely outside of the mercy of God, were women who sold themselves in the sex trade of the day as prostitutes. However, although these were considered to be the worst of the worst, they initially resisted the message of John the Baptist to repent from their sins. But afterward, they thought about it. And when they thought about it, they were convicted and they did repent and did turn from their sin and their lives were changed. Just like the son who initially refused to go into the vineyard, but afterward he changed his mind and he went in. That's what was being presented. Well, that leaves the second son. And the second son was representative of the religious leaders. Oh, they talked, they Great religious game, but they were not sincere. They outwardly claimed to live in obedience to God's law, but it was nothing but a show. Sure, they prayed on the street corners for everybody to hear. Yes, they tithed of their tiniest spices imaginable to give the impression that they were so committed. Oh, they went to the synagogue services. They searched the scriptures daily. They did observable religious deeds to be seen by men. But Jesus said they were hypocrites. And when they heard the preaching of John the Baptist, oh, they listened, but they resisted it. When John called them a brood of vipers, which is exactly what they were, They never repented. Even after they saw the testimony of tax collectors and harlots getting saved, as it were, repenting, they still refused to believe. What does this parable reveal? The bottom line is that those who were considered the worst sinners by the religious leaders entered the kingdom before them, if they even entered at all. Jesus made it clear it didn't matter how sinful you were or how righteous you appeared to be. No matter how moral or immoral, all must recognize their need for Christ. You could be the worst of sinners and you could be saved if you turn to Christ. You can be the most self-righteous, morally pure person in this room and be lost unless you also repent of your sin and turn to Christ for salvation. The sinners who seem like such unlikely candidates to enter into heaven or to receive the message of John the Baptist, let alone the message of Jesus, they responded. They received it. On the other hand, the second group that should have known better, having known the scriptures, prophetically could have made the connection, refused to see it. They were blind guides leading people into a pit. And they rejected the Father. Folks, there are a lot of people today who go through the outward religious motions at the present moment. Even so soon as last Wednesday, there's a lot of people who went through a particular procedure involving dirt on their forehead as an outward sign. I'm going to give this up, and then once this is done, I'm probably going to pick it right back up again. This outward form of doing something for the purpose of somehow pleasing God. Listen, all the outward form of religiosity doesn't matter anything unless you come to salvation through Christ. It doesn't matter what you put on your forehead. 
Listen, it doesn't matter what, what translation of the Bible you take. And listen, if this doesn't come into here, into the heart, then it's nothing more than going through the motions. That's what the Pharisees did. It was all outward. It was all a presentation. Certain prayers that they would pray, certain activity that they would do. Emotional outbursts. God doesn't, isn't as concerned about the emotional outbursts as he's concerned about the transformation of the heart and life. That's what matters. The changed life. Not just an outward observance. And here we see Jesus again just stripping away any confidence being placed in religion as a means of salvation because salvation only comes through Christ alone and faith in the finished work of Christ and his blood applied to your life. The first mistake of the religious leaders is that they had denied the truth and the second followed they would not repent. The first parable that Jesus told left his opponents shocked and embarrassed and deeply wounded. Deeply wounded, but Jesus was not done. Actually, there was a follow-up parable, and this parable poured salt into the fresh wound. Look at what it says. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it. He dug a wine press in it and built a tower and he leased it to vine dressers and he went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one and stoned another. And he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. And then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him, cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore... When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said, he's going to destroy those wicked men miserably and leave his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Folks, the parable of the vineyard appears in three gospels, in Matthew, in Mark, as well as in Luke. Matthew gives us the mo most detailed account of the parable. And there are six main characters in this parable. First of all, there is the landowner, that is the father, that is God the Father. There is the vineyard, which is the nation of Israel. There are the tenant farmers who were to care for the vineyard. That was the Jewish religious leaders. There were the landowners, the owner of the vineyard servants who came to collect the fruit and were rejected. That would be the prophets, the messengers of the Lord who were not respected nor received and then you have the son, who is Jesus. And then you have the other tenants who would be given the vineyard. That speaks of the Gentiles and others who would believe in Christ. In the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 5 and verse 7, this is what it says. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. The owner of the vineyard was God himself. The Lord had prepared the nation of Israel. He had blessed them. He had a relationship with his nation like he had with no other. He had dug a trench. He had put a tower. He had put, I mean, everything necessary for them to blossom and grow had been provided for. He brought them into the promised land. And in bringing them into that promised land, he expected there to be fruit from his vineyard. But instead of fruit, there were wild grapes. And why is that? God had warned the nation before I bring you into this promised land. Do not get ensnared by the idolatry of the surrounding nations. In fact, you need to drive them out. Do not worship their idols. And if you do, and in the day that you do, these nations will become irritants in your, your eyes, thorns in your side. Did they respond? No, they rejected the word of the Lord. 
They got ensnared into idolatry. They began to worship false gods. And because of this, the Lord sent prophet after prophet warning them. You can read of their messages to the nation in the Old Testament. God saying, come back. God's saying, return, I saved you, you're, you're my bride, you're my child, and, and all of these things that God would send messengers, what do they do with them? They put them to death. They stoned them, they killed them, they imprisoned them. They did not hear, they would not listen. You think of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who for years just pleaded with the people, they would not listen. Isaiah, they said, ah, oh, we're not listening to you, here a little, there a little, we don't even know what you're talking about. And they kept on pleading and kept on rejecting, so they were carried away into captivity. And when they were brought back in, they were given a second chance. And then the religious leaders were to oversee. And they also rejected the Lord. Even though everything had been provided for. The Lord sent his servants to receive from the fruit. The prophets, they, they were rejected by the people. And then finally the landowner said, all right. I'm going to send my son. Surely they'll respect him. I mean, my son. And who is the son? It's Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called children of God. Well, he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was the purpose of his ministry initially, but they rejected him. They did not receive him. In fact, they were going to put him to death. And here, Jesus is prophesying almost through this parable of what's about to happen, what's going on in the minds of the religious leaders. They were planning, they were plotting to put Jesus to death, and he's telling them what they're planning on doing. They would kill the only begotten son, crucify him. Jesus then asks the question, what's going to happen to these wicked tenants of the vineyard? who rejected every messenger that they were sent, who crucified the son, who put him to death? What's going to happen to them? And they responded again with the right answer. They, said, they knew what the answer was. They said that the owner of the vineyard is going to destroy these wicked men miserably and he's going to give the vineyard to somebody else. The leaders had the right answer to the question. They, they knew the truth, but they did not apply the truth. The teaching of Jesus was revealing the condition of their own heart, and yet they failed to see it. They even declared that judgment was coming, but they were so spiritually proud, they never thought that judgment would come upon them. Folks, listen. The word of God has the ability to reveal and uncover, unmask the condition of every heart in here today. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When the word of God is presented, it, it cuts through all of the nonsense, all of the, the facade, everything that we put up, and it just goes right to the heart. And be very careful if when hearing the word of God, you respond with, this would be really good for, what's his name? I really need to send this to her. Are you listening to what he's saying? Because this is for you. I mean, that kind of an attitude. Listen, God's word applies to every, every one of us in here. How do you respond when the word of God is presented? Oh, they knew the right answer, but it didn't change their life. They had the answer to the test, but they never applied it. This applies to everybody else, but not to me. I'm not as bad as they are. They are far worse. Jesus then quotes from Psalm 118. Again, this is a messianic psalm. It's the same psalm that they quoted at the beginning of the week when they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He quotes further down from this passage in verse 22, 23, and notice what he says. Jesus said to them, quoting from Psalm 118, have you, and this would have been offensive, when he said, have you never read in the scriptures? I was like, oh, that stung. I mean, all they did was read the scriptures. But this is saying, obviously, you missed the important part. And here it is. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our eyes. Jesus looks back at the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 118, and he pointed out the fact that the stone that was mentioned there, 
the chief cornerstone that was rejected by the builders, Jesus is the cornerstone. The builders that rejected him were the religious leaders. They rejected him, and yet he was still the chief cornerstone. The fact that they rejected him did not change who he was. Jesus would be the stone. He would be the foundation that was to be built on. Even though the builders and the Pharisees stumbled over him, threw him out, sought to get rid of him, regardless of what they did, he would still be the chief cornerstone. Listen carefully. Even though you reject Christ, it doesn't change who he is and what he said and what he's done. He is the rock. You can reject him, but he still remains who he is. You can say, well, I don't believe that. I live my truth. You live your truth. Jesus said he was the truth, period. So you can reject him, but it doesn't change who he is. We sang it today. He is alive. It sets him apart from everybody else. He's the chief cornerstone to which you want to build your life on. They rejected him, but it didn't change who he was. And then Jesus said in verse 43, here are the consequences of their rejection of the chief cornerstone. The rejection of the son. He said in verse 43, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone, talking about himself, this stone, this chief cornerstone will be broken, but whomever it falls on, it will grind him to powder. That's a powerful illustration. Jesus said the result of your rejection is what you have is gonna be taken from you and it's gonna be given to somebody else. And in so many ways, that's what happened to the nation. Only a matter of time before the temple would be destroyed, before the people would be dispersed for 2,000 years before they would come back together as a nation. And Jesus made that statement. There's two ways to approach him. Either you can fall upon him, humble yourself, and be broken, or he can fall upon you and grind you to powder. I want to encourage you on the first, the first one <laughs> to humble yourself before the Lord and just be broken just humbled before him, repent of sin, turn to him. And, and when you're broken, he makes you whole. He puts you back together. On the other side, if I reject that, I don't believe that, the stone's gonna fall on you. It's still the stone, it's still the rock, but this time it'll grind you to powder. How do you respond? You reject Christ, even what you have is gonna be taken away from you at some point. Well, I have this and I have this and I'm trusting in that. Do you really think you're gonna be able to hold on to that forever? At some point, that will be taken from you. And then what will you have? If you haven't built on Christ, listen, you have nothing. There's nothing for eternity except separation from God in a place called hell. On the other hand, if you have Christ, you have everything. And although things might be taken from you in this life, what you have for eternity will last forever. And nothing compares to that. It's glory. I can't imagine a person standing before Jesus having lived their whole life in rejection of him, a person who willingly separated themselves from Jesus their whole life, and now they're going to receive what they wanted. They, they want what they deserve, and it's eternal separation from God. I shudder to think about that. Peter uses this same passage after he heals the lame man at the beautiful gate in the book of Acts chapter four. Listen to what Peter says, and it confirms exactly what Jesus said. He says in Acts chapter four, verse eight, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he said to them, rulers of the people, elders of Israel, it's the same group. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, then let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. Verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter heard the words of Jesus there in the temple when confronted, and now he sees the fulfillment of it, and he quotes that he is the cornerstone, and there's no other way to be saved except through Jesus. 
It's only through Christ. Friend, let me ask you, who is, who is Jesus to you this morning? Is he the rock that which you're building your life upon? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? Is he your king? Or is he just some historical figure that you acknowledge as once existed in history past? Oh, friend, he's far more than that. Now, having heard these first two parables, suddenly the chief priests begin to, but they start to get it. They start to make the connection because in verse 45, it says, now, after these two pointed parables, now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, this, I, this amuses me, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Are you, I mean, can you just imagine them like, uh, oh, oh, you're, oh, you're, oh, are you saying that's for us? Yeah, pretty much, that's, that's for them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. They realized that what Jesus was saying was speaking directly to them. It was for them. It was about them. And rather than fall on the rock and be broken and repent, they hardened their hearts and sought to destroy Jesus. Again, you can respond to God's word in, in two diff, one of two different ways. I mean, you can receive it or reject it. They chose to reject it. They knew that this was speaking to them. And again, you can sit in a place like this week after week and you can hear the word of God being presented. You can have a truckload of sermons just poured out on you and leave with information and no transformation. Friend, don't leave just with information here. We don't just want to fill your head with facts we want your heart to be filled with Christ. We want you to be saved. That's the goal. That's what matters. And that's my heart for you. As the shepherd of this church, just to know that you're born again, to know that you're saved, that's what matters. The first parable, they rejected the father. Second parable, they rejected the son. Third parable, we're going to see they reject the work of the Spirit. Look at this next parable, this third and final parable of this trilogy in chapter 22, verse 1, the parable of the wedding feast. And Jesus answered and he spoke to them again by parables and he said, the kingdom of heaven is like, this is what the kingdom's like. Let me give you an illustration. A certain king who arranged a marriage for his son sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding they weren't willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited that I've prepared my dinner. My oxen, fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Notice the invitation. Verse five, they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his own business. They had other things to do. And the rest seized his servants treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies. He destroyed those murderers, burned up their city, and then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Here we have something that was very common in the Jewish culture. Two families, a prearranged marriage. You have... A daughter, another family has a son, your friends. You say, you know what? I think we ought to, I, the kids, we're, you know, we ought to get them together. Let's, they're probably not going to be able to decide for themselves. Let's decide for them. What do you say? I think it's a great idea. Let's do that. So they would have a prearranged marriage. Some cultures, they still do that even to this day. And we would set the kids up. They would start to grow up together. And at some point, when they got older, they would enter into a betrothal period. That is, they were as good as married. By the way, that's where Mary and Joseph were prior to 
the news of the arrival of Jesus. But betrothed, as good as married, the only way to separate was actually a bill of divorcement. You were married. And so what would happen in the waiting period is you would be getting ready for the ceremony. And so the bride would go with her parents. She'd be obviously living with her parents. Meanwhile, the groom would be in the father's house preparing for the wedding ceremony. And in the right time, in the right moment, the bride would be waiting for the groom's arrival, not knowing if he was coming in the evening, in the afternoon, or the morning, but she had to be ready. Keep your hair together. He's coming some point, right? All that you ladies go through. And then suddenly there's a knock at the door. It's him. The bride and her bridal party make their way through the streets to the father's house where they would have a celebration for seven days. People celebrating with them, family and friends. It was one of the most joyous occasions, this wedding banquet. Here the story is told of a king who was looking for and had a bride for his son. They're already betrothed. They're about to have the ceremony. Everybody gets an invitation sent out. And they get that invitation, and there were some who just, immediately, they just rejected it. I'm not going to that thing. We got stuff to do. What kind of foods are going to be there? Where's it at? I'm not driving there. No, no. What's the attire? You have to wear some? Nah, I'm not doing it. Then they went to a second group and they said, you know what? Uh, We're busy. I got a business. I got a, I got some cattle. I got to deal with right now. You guys have a great time. We're not coming. Okay. And then the third group gets an invitation and they just beat these people down, kill them, put them to death for sending them a wedding invitation. Wow. You got to be very selective who you send these to. (laughs) What is the point of all of this? The king heard about the rejection of the invitations. And he also heard about the death of his servants in delivering them. And he was enraged. The word actually comes from a word that means wrath. The king had been patient. He had been gracious with repeated attempts, urging these people to come and attend the feast. But his patience had a limit. And when the response to his messengers turned violent, the king's patience gave way to his justice. What is the meaning of this parable? Simply this, the father wanted a bride for his son. Who was the bride? It was the nation of Israel. Again, the bride. And you can see this picture throughout the Old Testament. He refers to them as the bride. And when they sinned against God in idolatry, it was referred to as spiritual adultery. They had, as it were, gone out on their groom. That was the bride for the son. And they rejected the invitation They would not come. And when others came, prophets, etc., messengers from the Lord, they put them to death, they imprisoned them. John the Baptist, beheaded. When Jesus shows up, the son himself, they would crucify him. You understand? They rejected the invitation. They were invited first, but they rejected it. And so when they had been rejected and the messengers had been rejected, they sent the message to other people. Other people who want, oh, I'm invited? No way, I can't even believe I got an invitation. Others, Gentiles, other people, other nations. Suddenly the Jews had rejected their Messiah. It opened up the door for others to come into this wedding celebration and ceremony and they were able to come and be a part of it. But then there was one man who snuck in. Verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, that is now everybody's gathered, everybody's there for the wedding supper, The feast, the king came in to see the guests and he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. There would be a particular garment given to you that you must wear in attendance. If you didn't have this, you couldn't get in. Somehow he got in unnoticed without a wedding garment. And he said, friend, how did you come in without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. What could he say? Verse 13, then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. When the king comes in to see the ceremony, 
He looks around. He's seeing everybody. Hey, how you doing? What's happening? Oh, thanks for coming. I'm so glad you came. It's good to see you. How's the food? I mean, he's going around saying hi to everybody, and he sees a guy without a wedding garment, and he realizes, who let you in? How'd you get in here? You, you can't come in without, you know? And the guy was like, uh, I don't know. He didn't say anything. And he was judged. He was thrown out. I mean, you think if you just throw a guy out, you're going to throw him out. Actually, it says bind him hand and foot, throw him out into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is that a reference to? You'll find throughout scripture, that's a reference to hell. What does this mean? What does this part of the parable imply? Here's what it implies. A picture of a person who tries to come into the kingdom on their own merit. You cannot get in that way. You cannot get in through your good works. You cannot get in through your religious connections. The only way you're getting in is if you've got the wedding garment. And what, friends, is the wedding garment that is acceptable into this wedding ceremony? It's the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. The righteousness of Christ. My righteousness, the Bible says, it's just filthy rags. It won't stand up. It's not good enough to be accepted. That is why God provides his righteousness through his son. The righteousness of Christ, because he died and I have trusted in him, I am now, and you are, if you're a believer, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, when the father looks at me, he sees the righteousness of his son and that is acceptable and I am welcomed in. I'm a part of this ceremony. I get to be a part of this, not because of what I've done. I just responded to the invitation. I wasn't worthy of it. I responded to it. I'm now clothed in his righteousness and I'm welcomed in and there is no other way to get in. It's the righteousness of Christ imputed. Without it, you can't make it. And those that try to come in their own way or reject the invitation, what happens? They're separated from God for eternity. There is heaven, there is hell. That's what the Bible teaches. There's two places. Have you been clothed in the righteousness of Christ? Can I give you another example of this? This is beautiful to me because the Bible tells us that we are the bride of Christ. The groom, obviously, it's the Lord. He's our bridegroom. And what is our bridegroom given to us? What does a groom give to a bride before they are to be wed? Well, he gives her a ring. An engagement ring, not a promise ring. Those are lame. <laughs> That's like, you know, I'm just going to put it on hold, see if it works out. And then, you know, that was just a promise ring. It wasn't the real thing. Like, beat it. Beat it. It's, it's just lame. Ladies, if you're wearing one right now, you better turn to your man and say, ah, uh, lame. Amen. Uh, so you, you, but an engagement ring, a real thing. When, you, when, they, when they have the engagement ring on, that, that means that I'm going to, I'm going to marry her. That is, that is, I'm putting the ring on. I'm, I'm coming for my bride. There's a day for the ceremony that is set. We're having an actual ceremony. That is my fiance, as it were. Folks, listen. You know what the Lord has given, given unto us as a guarantee? It reminds us of the engagement ring. You know what it is? The Holy Spirit. We are his. We are his. We've been bought with a price. We've been sealed by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. It's a guarantee we belong to him. Guess what our groom is doing right now? You know what he's doing? Preparing a place for us. Preparing a place for us. Where? In his father's house. Jesus said, listen, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I will receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. I'm like, it's coming for me. It's a matter of time. What am I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be ready. He could come in the morning. That'd be great. He could come in the afternoon. Ready. How about at night? Let's go. Any day is good. I am ready. He's going to come for his bride. And when the trumpet sounds and the bride is quickly taken to be with the Lord in the rapture of the church, do you know what happens? Suddenly the bride is tucked away. Where? In heaven. For how long? Seven days? Actually, seven years. Seven years. 
Meanwhile, down below, there is a tribulation period unfolding on this earth where there is the judgment of a Christ rejecting world and also Israel turning back to her Messiah. Meanwhile, the church, the bride, safely tucked away. The bride that was purchased by the blood of Jesus, the bride that has been rescued from wrath will not be subject to wrath because we've been saved out of it, tucked away. And after seven years, what happens? The bride comes back with the groom and he establishes his kingdom. And there we are with him, ruling and reigning. Folks, it's exciting to think about the future is so bright. Oh, I hope you're ready. I hope you're, hope you're ready for his coming. Jesus, in these parables of judgment, made it very clear that he was not the one being judged by the leaders, but actually he was judging the leaders. And out of their own mouths, they condemned themselves. Earlier, they didn't want to respond. They said, we don't know. And then Jesus asked them these parables and these questions, and they responded. And you find out they actually did know, and they condemned them. First of all, they rejected the father. When the father said, go into the vineyard, they said, we'll go, and they never went. That's the religious leaders. They rejected him. When the owner of the vineyard sent his servants and then sent his son, they rejected him. They killed him. And when he sought to draw them, invite them to the wedding, who is the one that invites us? Who is the one that seeks to draw us to the Father, it's the Spirit. The Holy Spirit seeks to draw people, to convict, to, to bring us in. They rejected the work of the Spirit and sought to get in some other way through their own righteousness, which was unacceptable. But there's a stark contrast as we conclude, and this is it. Although there were those that rejected, do you notice there were also those that responded? Because it says here, there were those who did go into the vineyard. Initially, they said, I'm not going. And they realized their condition, repented, and went. Responded to the Father. Then there were those who were aware of who owned the vineyard, and though it was taken from one group that rejected it, they received it, and they bore fruit. And then there were those who were it seemed were not invited. And then when this whole group that was supposed to be there rejected it, they had the invitation and they said, we're, yeah, I'm, I'm going. And they were clothed in righteousness and welcomed in to the marriage supper. Where do you sit in these parables? Which side are you on? Are you the one who is falling on the rock and being broken, humbled yourself before the Lord? Or are you the one whom the rock is falling upon and grinding to powder because of your rejection of the Lord? You're in one of two places today. There is no in-between. There is no middle ground. You're either for him or against him. You're either decided. You say, well, I'm undecided. Well, actually, you're decided if you're undecided. He's done everything necessary. The invitation is sent. He's made it clear. He came for you, for me. And all he asks is that you would respond, that you would humble yourself. He's not asking you to work for it. He did the work. He's asking you to respond to it. This is an invitation of love, of grace, of mercy, of forgiveness. Have you responded to that? Friend, do not let another day go by without responding to the one that loves you more than anyone could ever love you. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for the truth, Lord, the truth that sets us free, the truth that brings conviction but also brings healing and restoration and salvation. 
So Lord, I ask today that if there are any here in this room who are trying to get in through their own efforts and means, Lord, that today would be the day that they fall upon Jesus and just be broken. Oh, Lord, to be broken, to be humbled. Fact is, Lord, we're already broken. We're sinful. But Lord, you put us together and you give us a purpose and a meaning and a hope and a future. And I would encourage you today, if that's you, just wherever you're at, wherever you're seated, just humble yourself and say, Lord, forgive me. Save me, Jesus. I repent of my sin. I don't want to be separated from you. I want to be received and welcomed by you. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I turn my life over to you. In Jesus' name. And if you pray that from your heart, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says you, you will be saved. Will you stand with us this morning, church? <laughs> God has given us the invitations. And he wants us to pass them out. Listen, there may be some that say, listen, I'm, 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 that's your thing. I'm too busy. I'm doing stuff. Okay. Others that might say, if you bring that invitation to me one more time, it's, you're in trouble. Okay, cool. I'm not bringing you. Then there's other people that are like, I'll take it. I want in. I want to be there. All the Lord's asking us to do is to deliver the invitation. They can do with it what they want. It's my job to deliver the message, not to save somebody. It's my job to tell them how to get saved, and they're the ones that respond to the invitation. Just extend the invitation this week to somebody. Invite somebody. Maybe they didn't know that, that oh, I'm on the guest list. You can be. You definitely want to be, you want to be in on this one. This is, this is for eternity. May God help us to deliver the message this week. If you need prayer today, I encourage you to come up after the service. There'll be those up front that can pray for you for any needs that you might have. If not, may the Lord give you a beautiful week. Those of you coming back tonight, we'll see you this evening for the marriage uh, gathering and uh, look forward to what the Lord's going to do. God bless you, church. Have a beautiful, beautiful day and a great week in the Lord. Let's close in a song.